Private Lender Podcast, Episode 42. The Private Lender Podcast quote of the day comes to us from Zig Ziglar, who said, Rich people have small TVs and big libraries, and poor people have small libraries and big TVs. This is the Private Lender Podcast, the show that shares practical advice and know-how for new and seasoned lenders, from private mortgages on single-family houses to joint ventures on commercial projects and beyond. Discover details about investment vehicles that you won't find at your local bank or online broker. Listen and learn from private lenders and real estate investors, as well as from professionals and entrepreneurs, as they share the details, strategies, and the insight that allows for successful and prosperous lending. Now, get ready to increase your ROI. Here's your host, Keith Baker. Greetings and hello. What's going on in Lender Nation? Welcome to the Private Lender Podcast, the only podcast dedicated to supporting confident and successful private lenders while creating an alternative economy where we can all invest without banks or shady Wall Street brokers. My name is Keith Baker and you're listening to episode number 42. And I just want to take a minute and let you know that I appreciate sharing with me today, your most valuable asset, and that is your time. Even if you are commuting or just running or killing time, I do appreciate you sharing it and spending it with me listening to this podcast. I hope I can make everything worth your while as it is my goal to provide private lenders just like you and me with help mitigating risks and increasing our yields and opening doors for bigger and brighter possibilities, bigger and brighter yields and return on an investment as well. Today's topic is foreclosure, and I have just started the foreclosure process or moving towards starting the foreclosure process, and my goal is to walk you, the listener, through each step of the way, and share with you what's happened, how we got here, and share my thoughts, and maybe, just maybe, I'll share my feelings too, because this is where the healing begins. But before we do that, Let's go ahead and thank this episode's sponsor. This episode of the Private Lender Podcast is proudly sponsored by CountyTaxSaleApp.org. With CountyTaxSaleApp.org, you get a very powerful lead generation tool in the palm of your hand, on your laptop, desktop, or any device you choose. Get real-time alerts for between 300 and 600 properties every month that are coming up for the foreclosure auction in Harris County, Texas, the third largest county in the United States. With this intuitive design and interface, the County Tax Sale app lets you search all properties with highly motivated sellers that are coming up for foreclosure auction. Simply search the map and click on a property to learn important details about that property, such as the address, owner's contact info, minimum bid, and a street view photo. You can save properties to your favorites and contact the sellers directly and receive email and text alerts if one of your favorite properties is redeemed or canceled prior to the auction. You can even listen to Sammy Gupta on episode 28 of this podcast as he discusses all the powerful features and benefits of CountyTaxSaleApp.org. For more information, go to the Private Lender Podcast sponsor page, the show notes page for this episode, or to CountyTaxSaleApp.org. That's CountyTaxSaleApp.org. I'd like to thank CountyTaxSaleApp.org for their sponsorship of this show especially Sammy Gupta. And if you can hear me, please, please, please go check them out. You really can't find uh, a cheaper lead generation tool out there for, I think it's less than three cents a day. And it doesn't matter what device you have or where you are in the world, you can still invest in Harris County, Texas. Third largest in the nation, I do believe. And it's a, it's a pretty, it's a really good deal. Uh, that's countytaxsaleapp.org. Please check them out. Okay, so now to the nitty gritty, foreclosure. So what happened? Well, story time, kids. Gather around. So about a year and a half ago, we started actively seeking distressed owners. We found one for a house that was in Port Arthur. That's a, a very much an industrial town, part of the Golden Triangle, east of Houston, along the coast, and very close to the very, very close to the border of Louisiana, the Sabine River, and it's the hometown of a lot of people. Uh, apparently. Janis Joplin, for one, and many others. The Golden Triangle is home to a lot of famous athletes and even some actors as well. So we found this house, and we were able to negotiate the purchase of a house. It was in very, very, very bad shape and had a lot of uh, back taxes owed up on it. And we negotiated with the owner, 
to purchase it for what was owed in taxes. He was also getting tired of getting citations from the city of Port Arthur when they would come and cut the grass for him. So anyway, he was happy to get rid of it. And what we did, because it was in such bad shape, rather than going in and and spending a lot of money and doing a fix and flip on the rehab, we decided let's go ahead and just try to owner finance this. So we paid cash for the house and ended up selling it last August of 2017 for $30,000 owner finance at, I think it was 10%. Yeah, 10% interest over, and we put it out, I believe it was over 15 years. I'm sorry, 10 years. So everything closed, everything went fine. Because the person who was buying the house was not an investor, but rather was going to be the owner-occupant, we went through a residential mortgage loan originator who vetted our potential buyer, borrower. And once they did their magic and did crunch the numbers and figured out that, okay, he could afford, you can't get rent for, the, for what we were charging a month on the, on the note. So he, he closed, he moved in, and then a little thing called Hurricane Harvey happened. And we kept our communication up with the owner saying, look, don't worry about paying. We'll do a little forbearance. Just get on your feet. The house did flood. I guess I should say that first. That the house did flood. And one of my biggest mistakes there was I did not demand flood insurance. Even though, and I, look, razz me, email me, call me, text me, call me out on social media. It's definitely a mistake that I made when you, when you have a property that close to the water. Even though it's not in the floodplain, I mean, common sense should tell you you get a big enough storm surge and going to take on some water. This house is actually pretty close to the coast, about a block or two away. So it took on water. We told the buyer, look, just stay in it. Don't worry about paying us right now. Just get it cleaned out. Do what you got to do so that you can live in it. And we'll work something out later on down the line. And he made one payment after Harvey and then a half a payment. And we told him, look, get yourself, get on a good foundation, get on your feet again financially. And, you know, we'll talk about the payments later. The house is still yours. It's not going anywhere. What we really wanted was him to stay in it, one, to occupy it. So it keeps the likelihood of vandalism down, but two, to keep him in it so he could repair it and fix it up. So long story short, after reaching out to him and letting him know, please stay in, he has now abandoned the property, hasn't made a payment in over eight months. Even though we were trying to keep him in, and give him as much leeway as possible because that's just really crappy timing to buy a house. And then a week or two later, or yeah, two weeks later, three weeks later, you get flooded out by a hurricane. One of the, the biggest natural disasters this part of the country's seen in a very, very long time. So in order to sell the property again, we have to legally, we have to foreclose on it. My company is just the lien holder. Our borrower is still the owner of record, although he's, I don't want to say skip town, but he's gone. So now the foreclosure process begins. And like many of you, I've got a full-time job that I don't need to be messing around with attorneys, but my partner and I do have an attorney picked out and I have emailed said attorney and laid out the situation and said, this is what we need. We need to follow all of the state foreclosure laws to the T because this is an owner occupant. If this were a investor, the laws would not protect that investor as much as they do a consumer owner occupant. So in the interest of keeping everything above board, everything legitimate, we've decided to engage an attorney. And I said, let's get this. What do you need from me? Knowing what was needed, I just introduced myself. What do you need from me just to get the ball rolling? And that's kind of the, the level that we're at right now. So here's what the attorneys need in order to process a foreclosure, or at least to send the the notice of default, letting the borrower know they have 20 days to cure the default and bring the the loan current. If they fail to do that, then we go to the courthouse steps and the property is auctioned. And if nobody bids high enough, then the property will go back to us, my company, that per my LLC that purchased the property and then sold it with owner finance, I should say. So you definitely need a few things. You need the actual promissory note that the borrower signed, or at least a a good copy of it, a good scan to send over to the attorney. 
You also need the deed of trust. Basically, all the paperwork that the borrower signed at closing, you're going to need copies of. So the deed of trust is going, that's what puts the property up for as collateral. And that's how the lien is secured or the lien is placed against that property, securing the lender, my position in this case. So I need all that paperwork on that from that transaction at closing. Then need an arrearage statement, which is essentially an accounting, an amortization table, sort of, but it's when did the loan start? What payments have been made? How much were those payments? When were they made? How much interest was reduced? How much principal was reduced? The attorneys are going to need to see all of that before they can even write the letter and send it to the borrower, letting them know that we're calling the note due and you need to pay up or we're going to foreclose on you. Now, when the, on the arrearage statement, again, you break down the principal and the interest. And here's something that's very, also very important. Late charges in those deeds, that promissory note, in those documents, it's going to, your lawyer should have outlined what the penalty is. How many days until the payment is late? And in this case, there's a big grace period because it's an end consumer, owner occupant in there. But there's a late charge if they don't pay on time. So those are going to add up. Any escrow fees, and by that, that's your loan servicing fees that your borrower has to pay. Also taxes, insurance, any HOA or any other fees that your loan servicer will collect on your behalf every month and then pay for you on an annual basis. And then you need any prior unpaid costs of collection. So if we had already sent somebody, we've already sent a couple of certified mail return receipt letters to the owner. And so we'll put those costs in as well. And that brings you up to speed to where we are today. All this has just started on back and pulled all the documents. Of course, late on a Friday night, I did all this, but emailed it over to the law firm, to the attorney, and await his communication with me on Monday morning to let us know where we go from there. Now, what's also going to happen is before he even starts anything, I'm going to have to pay him some money. So in addition to all of that fun stuff, this is probably going to end up running about $1,200 all said and done. There'll be a few hundred dollars for the letter and then several hundred dollars for the actual foreclosure. So he'll get it listed down at the county clerk's office and all that fun stuff. While, all while I sit back and do my job in my normal day to day. And so you could ask the question, well, why don't you just do this? Can you do this yourself? A lot of it you can. But here's the thing. If you botch a foreclosure, it can really come back and haunt you. If you don't do everything by the letter of the law, dot your I's, cross your T, T's, it can really hurt you. Now, that's to an investor because they, you give the, if you're selling owner finance to an investor, you're giving them a lot of leverage. When that owner finance borrower is an owner occupant, he's no longer considered a business. He's considered a consumer and consumers are afforded much more protection under state and federal law no matter where you live, than an investor, a business deal. So for me, do I want to pull $1,200 out of my pocket to pay this attorney? Hell no. Am I going to do it? You're darn right I am. Because he knows the process. He knows the law. He knows how to do what needs to be done. I write the check. I provide the information. I wait for him to let me know when the house is mine again so I can put it back on the market and sell it. And I do need to go look at the property to see last time I saw it, it was not in good condition. So my exit strategy with this is to go ahead, take back the property, wipe out the original loan, and then resell it to either an investor or an owner occupant. I think this time I'm going to go with an investor. I won't shun away or pass turn away a owner occupant with money and that can a decent job. I don't hold any hard feelings against this guy because he bought a house and then it got flooded by Harvey. Just some really, really bad luck. I did want him to stay in there. Selfishly, of course, yes. I wanted him to take care of the property. But more importantly, I don't like doing the foreclosure. I'd rather get my monthly payment every month, you know, first of the month, get my mailbox money, than have to go through all this hassle. We tried to do a deed in lieu of foreclosure, which means basically he would just deed, he would sign the paperwork and give the house back to us, which would avoid the whole foreclosure process. We would file that paperwork with a county clerk, and that would show that the house, he purchased the house, but he has deeded the house back over to us. So now my company, my LLC is the 
owner of record and has legal authority to go back out market and sell that property. So a couple of things to quickly take away. Number one, I don't regret making this deal at all. It was a good deal. I'll make it again tomorrow. It's unfortunate that we have to foreclose. I really do feel bad for the borrower, but after a year's time, now we owe the also, we also owe back taxes. So in order to take the house back, it's going to cost uh, a, a couple of grand, maybe two to 3,000 to get it back. There is that cost that I do definitely want to recoup, but I do feel for the borrower and his family and wish him all the best. But at the same time, this is my business. So I want to take the house back, which I rightfully can do, legally can do. We'll do and put it back on the market. See if we can't get it sold again. And I do like originating owner finance notes that you do it right. You put enough spread in it. It's going to uh, be very lucrative. And if I can, I can later on sell that note, even at a discount and still make money. So anyway, that's where things are for right now. What I do definitely now require flood insurance within 50 miles of the coast. And that's just, that's a huge broad brush. I know, but if I'm going to invest in properties along the Texas Gulf Coast, it's inevitable a hurricane will come through at some point. We also have tremendous spring and summer thunderstorms. And with all that moist air coming off the Gulf, you just never know what's going to happen. We also get some tornadoes and whatnot. So flood insurance is something that I require now on all my loans. And if somebody complains to me that they can't afford $400 a year for the FEMA-backed flood insurance pro- national flood insurance program, then I walk away because then they don't have a deal. Plain and simple, that's a cost of doing business. Yes, unfortunate it is, but I'd rather the borrower pay $400 a year to keep my investment protected than me have to pay $1,200 to foreclose. Uh, do the math, I know, yeah. They get stuck in the long run paying more, but they're protecting their property and my asset or the asset that's backing my investment. So moving forward, always have flood insurance. That's my motto. And it's angering a lot of people, but hey, it's my money. I'm going to invest it the way I want to invest it. All right. Well, that's going to do it for the installment one of the foreclosure process, the Port Arthur House saga. I want to thank you guys again for listening and want to bring a couple of things to your attention. Number one, sometime, I believe it's going to be in November. I will be participating in an online summit. So go to privatelenderpodcast.com slash events for more information on that. Nothing's been solidified yet. We're still trying to work the dates, but in about six weeks, four to six weeks, there's going to be an online summit and it's going to be a ton, a ton of good information on it. And it's basically, it's going to be like a three-day seminar. And for the price, the cost is much, much less than say a three or four-day seminar that I've been to recently. That can run as much as five hundred to a thousand dollars, just for a few hundred bucks. I think it's gonna be about three hundred bucks. You get three days of content from people. Yes, some people will be selling, but there are a lot of great programs out there. That's number one. Number two, about a week after the summit, you're gonna get replays of everybody's presentation. So from the beginning to the end, it's three days worth. It's a lot, a lot of content, a lot of great ideas. And even if you don't pursue any one person's content or coaching or education, just jotting down the notes and connecting the dots alone is going to be well, well worth your time and your money. So please stay tuned for more information about that online summit. Also, it's time for me to grovel and beg, please. If you can hear my voice, please go to iTunes, leave a rating and review, an honest one. I would love five stars, but if you don't honestly feel that I deserve it, give me what you feel like I do deserve. I greatly appreciate it. Lower a star review is still a review. It puts this podcast up in the algorithm, iTunes algorithm, so that more and more people will be exposed to it when they go onto iTunes. The more people exposed to it, the bigger the reach, the broader the reach, the more people, so on and so forth. You get the point. And that's my goal is to reach as many people and let them know that, yes, you can be a private lender. Yes, it's legal. And yes, it can be lucrative. If you want a Ferrari and girls in bikinis, then you don't listen to this. but you want old world, old school, proven techniques and mindset and actions to take to increase wealth little by little, one win at a time, then this is for you. And don't forget, while you're leaving that rating and review, go ahead and promote your business. Put your web page out there. Put your phone number, your email address. Let us know who you are and what you do. 
And please spread the word. Please connect with me on social media. You can find me at Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, LinkedIn, Bigger Pockets, and of course, at privatelenderpodcast.com. That's going to do it for this episode, Lender Nation. I want to thank you again. I hope everyone's Q4 is rolling on for a very happy and successful end of the year. And I wish you all happy and prosperous lending and investing. I'll see you on the next episode. Thanks so much for listening to this episode of Private Lender Podcast with your host, Keith Baker. For more great content and to stay up to date, visit privatelenderpodcast.com. If you enjoyed today's episode, please rate and review, and we'll catch you next time.